Good morning and welcome to Grace Christian Center. Good morning. Good morning. The title of the sermon this morning is Running from Your Worst Fears. Running from Your Worst Fears. Now a lot of you, whether you want to admit it or not, have some type of fear that comes upon you every now and then. And um, it does not come from God because God is not the author of confusion. Whenever you're experiencing confusion, fear, frustration, doubt, um, worry, that comes from the enemy. It comes from the kingdom of Satan. It comes from demonic spirits. It comes from demonic influences. And the, our life is like a bunch of doors. We, we leave some doors open. We leave some doors shut. And when we leave the doors open that lead to, to these demonic things, that's what comes into our life. Fear. Fear, 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 fear is, is the greatest killer of all. It's worse than cancer. It's wor worse than any physical sickness we could ever think of. Fear can drive us into the depths of darkness. Fear can drive us totally away from the throne room of God. Fear. There is a man by the name of Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of the Bible. And 1 Kings chapter 18, in your own Bible time, read this, but in 1 Kings chapter 18, that chapter records one of the greatest victories that Elijah had ever experienced as a prophet of God. Over 450 false prophets of Baal had been slaughtered. Now, that sounds kind of harsh, amen? We're not going to go today as a Christian church and go out and slaughter <laughs> false religions or anything like that. But um, in the old times, times were different. Elijah had experienced one of the greatest victories of his life. And a lot of times when we experience victories in our Christian walk, and I'm speaking to the Christian this morning, a lot of times when you experience victories in your life, you tend to let your guard down afterwards. And you tend to be able to think, well, I got it now, or I'm, 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 I got control of this. And it's very natural. Human instinct is to want to take control of your life and want to do what you want to do and kind of lean on your own wisdom. That, that's, that's the norm. Say amen. 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 Because we all go through that. Well, this is demonstrated in the life of Elijah. One of the greatest prophets, one of the greatest men to ever walk on the face of the earth. And by the way, I do believe he is one of the, this is my opinion, I do believe he is one of the two witnesses that come back in the book of Revelation. Elijah has never died. He just simply was taken up into heaven in a chariot of uh, fire. And uh, so he is to return, I believe, my opinion, where we can agree to disagree, but I do believe that he is one of the two witnesses that will return back upon the face of the earth as recorded in the book of Revelation. But Elijah, in chapter 19, verse 1, he's just experienced a powerful, powerful victory and all of a sudden he is about to find out that things can change in the twinkle of an eye. Amen? Amen. By the way, Jesus says, I come in the twinkle of an eye. Amen. Things can change so quickly, Amen. so fast. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 1. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid, and arose and ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. The queen, Jezebel, was a worshiper of the God, the false God that Elijah and the God of heaven and earth had destroyed. And when Queen Jezebel had heard that all her ministers and priests were, were annihilated, she tended to want to kill this man. Amen? Now I know the words are behind me, but if y'all can just listen to me for a moment, because we're going to be doing a lot of reading and, and speaking and reading and speaking. So I really need your attention here. Uh, a lot of times, when you do great victories for the Lord, it gets the attention of the enemy. Amen? Amen. It gets the attention of the enemy. And what we're going to do is, I want to look at the, the story of Elijah, and I want to talk about how, even though God can do some great things in your life, you must always keep your guard up, because the enemy is always watching. Now, who is our enemy? For Elijah, the enemy was Queen Jezebel. She was, she was controlled by, I believe, demonic spirits. And today, the, there's no different. We're not at battle with flesh and blood. But people can be con controlled by the enemy's 
of this war of God by demonic spirits. They can listen and they can do what the enemy would want them to do. But we're not at battle with flesh and blood. We're not at battle with them. The very first thing that, sh that hit the heart of Elijah was fear. When he heard a curse, an accusation. Now, I do want to say this. When Queen Jezebel spoke this, it was a curse. This is also the same saying that was recorded in 1 Samuel. When the, the little boy, the prophet Samuel, had heard from God for the first time and told him about the prophet Eli and prophesied over Eli. When Eli heard about this, Eli told Samuel the same thing Jezebel said in reference to Elijah. She goes, may the gods ever deal with me more severely if you do not get to him and tell him this. But, but let, let me move on a little bit. It goes on to say here that he was afraid and he ran. He heard the curse. He was afraid. He took off. He ran. He ran for his life and he left his servant there. A lot of times when you come into a when you come into a when you come into a um, a room, dark room, and you know there's roaches in there. When you turn on the light, when you turn on the light, what happens? The roaches scatter. Amen. 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 The roaches scatter, and that is exactly what happened. Elijah was fearful. He left his servant and he took off. He didn't even. This was a man that he was in charge of, but yet when he was the self center of an attack. He left people behind. Now, it goes on to say also that when we and you go through times of trouble, when me and you are attacked by an enemy, we tend to want to leave everything else. Sure. Things that we're entrusted with, we want to leave them behind also. This prophet of God, he goes on to say, left his servant, he took off, he ran for his life. When the enemy attacks you, that's, a, that's an indicator that when you want to leave your fear for your life, you just leave people behind. That is an indicator that you're under demonic attack. It goes on to say here in verse 4, But he himself, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, Arise, eat. And then he looked, and behold, there was a, at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank, and he lay down again. And then the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, when we get in trouble, we head into the wilderness. The wilderness is a place, spiritually speaking, of trials of tribulation, of temptation, of testing. When Jesus was, in the, was tempted, was led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted in the wilderness, it was to be tempted by Satan, but to be tested by God Almighty. John the Baptist, when he preached the gospel, well, when he preached the baptism of repentance of sin, he was preaching the water baptism. He was out into the wilderness and he was doing his work. When Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he went into where? The wilderness. And a lot of times when you get attacked, and if you run for your life, if you just give the enemy any ounce of, of, of ground to stand on, you're in a sense you can run into the wilderness. And you can feel isolated. You can feel like, you know, you know how like, has anybody ever been in the desert and you don't have cell phone coverage anymore? You feel cut off from the rest of the world? In a sense, that's the way it is. He runs into the wilderness and he's isolated. And he just wanted to die. He wanted to take my... He said, Lord, take my life. You know, just a short time ago, he was in one of the greatest victories of his life. And just see how, how quickly things could change, how quickly things can happen in someone's life. It goes on to say here, he goes, I'm not better than my father's. A lot of times we like to measure ourselves up to our, our parents. We like to measure ourselves up to people. And we cannot do that anymore, my friend. There's only one standard that we have to meet. 
And that's the standard of Jesus Christ. You, you cannot walk in the footsteps of your ancestors. But Jesus Christ is our standard. And for every one of us, Jesus will meet us to a certain point, every one of us individually, and He'll slowly work in you, and He'll slowly encourage you, and He'll slowly feed you in how you should go. But He was in the wilderness. He had fear in His heart. He forgot about His servant. He ran into the wilderness. He came under a tree which had given Him shade, apparently, but He still didn't see the comfort of God, even though God was giving Him comfort under a tree. He laid down. He wanted to sleep. He wanted to die. And an angel of the Lord came to Him, touched Him. And, and that, that's what I like. It says an angel touching Him. you got to understand something. And we're not into worshiping angels like some of these churches do. But angels of God, according to the New Testament, are ministering spirits. And just as they did in the Old Testament, they still to this day come and they encourage you. We don't light a candle and pray to them. We don't do nothing like that. But they are sent to encourage us. Amen. And now Elijah was wanting to die. But supernaturally, there appeared food right there for him. This is not the first time that happened for Elijah. He was in a famine for three years. There was no water that had fallen. And God was able to put Elijah by a brook and allow water to flow. And Elijah had water to drink for three years. And God allowed Elijah to have food brought to him by the ravens, by the birds of the air. So this is not the first time that Elijah supernaturally had his needs met by God Almighty. And so we're trying to see what, what the Word of God is trying to show you is that it is so easy for the man of God, for the woman of God, to get caught up in some mess that Satan is wanting you to get all caught up in. But God will still supernaturally meet your need. It's so ironic how we go on the read here, Elijah is still in doubt up until pretty much the very end of this story. And a lot of times, our faith, if it's not strong, rooted right, correctly in the Word of God, our faith can fail us and we can fail God ultimately. It goes on to say here in verse 7, I'm sorry, verse 6, it says, And he looked and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. The Lord knew he needed to eat and the Lord knew he needed to drink. And today Jesus says, First seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness and everything shall be added unto you. But you see, a lot of people can't trust the Lord anymore. A lot of people don't understand that God can supernaturally meet your need, your physical need, your spiritual need. But a lot of people don't do that. You know what people do today as a pastor, what I see more and more happening? People try and have control of their own lives. People try and make things happen on their own when they could very easily get the need met sooner, faster, and bring glory to God by just trusting in the Lord, calling on Him, and let the Lord open the door that they can walk through. But Elijah, he was a man who was dearly loved by the Lord. And the Lord saw, and God will honor your faithfulness. Even though Elijah was afraid and running for his life, and Elijah was caught up in idolatry because he was thinking all about self. And when you think about self, you're caught up in idolatry worship. And even though Elijah was caught up in this stuff, God still remembered Elijah's faithfulness and love in the chapter before, in chapter 18. And God will honor that. And God's seen your, your before the battles and He'll see you how you're going to be after the battles. And God carries you and God loves you so much. And there comes a point in time, why, why, Christian, why? And I speak to you by way of video. Why do you want to try and make things happen on your own? You know, we delay the blessing of God by trying to allow it to make things happen on our own strength, on our own wisdom, on our own understanding. We delay the blessings of God. God is a gentleman. He'll stand back and He'll let you do what you got to do. He'll let you do what you have to do. So He arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. God knows when you're going to go into the battle. You know, Jesus was in the wilderness how many days? 40 days, 40 nights. It was a time of testing. When, when, when Noah was in the ark, how many days did it rain? 40 days, 40 nights. It was a time of cleansing. It was a time of testing. You know, Noah could have opened up that boat and looked and water could have came gushing in, but he trusted God and kept the doors shut. And he knew the water was hitting the roof of that boat, but Noah trusted in the Lord and knew that one day that rain was going to stop. 
And you've got to trust in the Lord knowing that the things you're going through in your life, that one day, even though you can feel the, the, the clawing of the, the demonic spirits on your feet and everything trying to attack you, you've got to trust in the Lord knowing that one day these things will come to a halt. God is not going to put something on you that you cannot handle. And i got scripture for that pretty soon here in just a minute. But we have to come in the day that we're in and the hour that we're living in at the imminent return of Jesus Christ. You either, Christian, you've got to come to a point in your life. Are you going to learn what it means to live in a supernatural realm and trust in the Lord? Or are you still going to struggle in the physical, what you see and what you hear, and your need never be met? And maybe we'll come to a realization one day that you were never even saved in the first place. It's time for the true people of God to stand up and allow their faith to be demonstrated by all the world to see. Jesus said this, the world will know my disciples by the love they have for one another. Amen. When we can learn to love each other in the church, God will be glorified and God's going to start moving out there. But when there's fighting and bickering going on in the church, when, when, when Elijah left his servant, didn't even care for his servant's own life, you know, how, how is God going to move? But God was trying to show a demonstration of His grace and mercy. Now, grace and mercy, let me say this right now. Grace and mercy, we don't deserve neither. In grace, God gives us something that we don't deserve. And in His mercy, He takes something from us away that we do deserve. We deserve hell. We deserve eternal separation. But because He has mercy on us, He takes hell away from us. And in grace, in His grace, He gives us His Son, Jesus Christ. Now it goes on to say in verse 9, after Elijah realized in verse 8 that he was going to go on a 40-day trip, he had two meals, two meals, and he was going to go into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights further. He was going to go to a mountain. He was going to go to the mountain of Oreb, and that's a whole other scripture there, I mean a teaching, but he was going to go and he was going to meet God. God said, I have an appointment with you. He goes, I I'm going to talk to you, but eat this food and get up and start moving for 40 days and 40 nights. For 40 days and 40 nights, Elijah was depressed. He was going through hell. He was going through torment in his mind. He, he, was, he was hungry. He was thirsty. You go 40 days and 40 nights without food or water. We cry when we miss a meal. But here was a man of God who was under tremendous pressure. He was a man of God who was under intense demonic persecution. Life was hanging in the balance here. Life was hanging in the balance. It goes on to say that he went, and in verse 9 it goes on to say, Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? A lot of times the Lord will say to you, What are you doing here? Well, what are you doing? Why are you acting like that? Why are you doing this? What are you doing here? God, God speaks to you. Has anyone ever been caught in something and they're even asking themselves, what am I doing? But you keep doing the same thing over and over and over. That's exactly what God was trying to demonstrate here in Elijah. What are you doing here? What, what, what are you, actually, God told him, go over there. You're going to go to a mountain. I'm going to meet you. But then when he goes there... God says, what are you doing here? You know, it's kind of like contradicting itself. Well, God, I would have said, well, God, you told me to come here. You know, not, not really. I mean, if you had had the faith in the beginning, you wouldn't have even had to gone through all this mess. You could have stood to Jezebel and say, as the Lord slayed these false prophets, the Lord shall slay you too, if you don't turn to him also. You know, that's how the story could have ended. You know that, by the way, don't you? Elijah could have stood before the king and queen. And he could have told them the same thing that he told those 450 false prophets. But because of one voice, and that's all it takes for the, for, for the people of God to become their cattle, I mean, their, their, their cages rattled. Only one voice can rattle your cage. Amen? Amen. Right. Only one voice, that's all it takes. And it only takes one voice to bring you back to the path of God. That's Jesus Christ. It goes on to say in verse 10, Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. 
And behold, the Lord was passing by. I want to stop right there. When the Lord said, what are you doing here? Elijah is crying. Well, wah, 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 wah. He's crying. I'm the only one left. Now, 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 just hear me out. Just, just listen to me. Stop reading. He's crying. He's saying, me, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one that, that loves you. I'm the only one. And now they got the sword. They want to, you know, the, 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 there's coming death. And he's just, he's just crying. His faith is fleed him. He goes and saying, verse 11, God says, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rendering the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire was the sound of a gentle blowing. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and his cloak. And he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? It's so important that the Lord asked him twice, What are you doing here, Elijah? A lot of times when we want God to move in our lives also, by the way, you want the ground to shake. You want people set on fire. You want your enemies just scattered to the wind. Amen? You just want all heaven and earth to move when you pray. Amen? Oh Lord, take this cancer away in Jesus' name. You start praying and you get a prayer circle going and prayer chain going and you just want heaven and earth to move. You want there to be visual confirmation that God is moving. Amen? Amen. And God is trying to say, I'm not in all that. Sometimes. But I'm not in all that theatrics. I'm not in earth, wind, and fire. I'm not talking about the band, okay? But the Lord says, I'm not in all that. The Lord says, a lot of times, the Lord says, I'm a gentle whisper. Because you know why? Because a lot of us, all of us, we need peace. We need peace with the Lord so that we can have peace with everyone else around us. And so that way, the Lord will speak to you peace, quietly, in a soft... It's so amazing. You know, when you see, when I hear the voice of the Lord, you know, and it's true, God can demonstrate Himself in many different ways. When the people told Moses, we want to hear God for ourselves. They stood at the mountain, the foot of the mountain, and, got, and Moses said, alright Lord, you, you have it. And the Lord started speaking, you know, the, the shofar horn, I believe it was, or something like that, and I got to go back and read all that, but it was a loud, tremendous sound. Now, the people were scared to death, and they couldn't stand to hear this. They were, they were fixing to die. Because God, in His majesty, in His power, in His awesomeness, He was, to a certain point, showing them, okay, you want to hear me? Fine. But you see, what Elijah needed was peace. What Elijah, he didn't need to hear that big old sound that, they, that the children of Israel heard in the, in, in the desert with Moses. They didn't need to hear that big old grand voice. They just needed to hear a still, Moses, uh, Elijah needed to hear a still small voice because he needed peace. Now, granted there are some people that are living so knee deep in sin that God will speak to you in a loud way. Don't get me wrong. God will move heaven and earth to get your attention. He will. But for Elijah, the man of God, the prophet of God, he said, Elijah, I don't have to yell at you. I don't have to show an awesome brilliance of colors to you because you know who I am. <coughs> Elijah, you know the anointing that I gave you from when you were a little boy. Elijah, you ought to know better than this. You know my power. You know my glory. You know my love for you, Elijah. So what are you doing here, Elijah? Well, what are you doing here? And a lot of times God will speak to you just like that. What are you doing? Stop it. Put childish things aside. Quit being selfish. Quit being ignorant. Quit being stubborn. Quit being rude. What are you doing? Quit compromising. Quit playing with sin. What are you doing? What are you doing?
Verse 14, Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You see there are a lot of eyes in that sentence. Elijah was caught up in idolatry. I, 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 when he should have been saying, you, Lord. You know they're after me, but Lord, I trust in you. So in you, God, I call upon you today, God. And Lord, I know you will deliver me from all enemies. I know, Lord, that you will set me in the presence. You will set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You, Lord, you. And instead, it's I, I, I. When we're caught up in that speech of I, 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 I'm going through all this and I'm going through all that. You're in a bad place. You need to stop it. The Lord is saying, what are you doing? Don't you know who you're talking to? I, I believe a lot of times when we're praying and we're crying to God, I feel, I feel like God is wanting to say sometimes to us, don't you know who you're talking to? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know I own all the gold and all the silver? Don't you know I own the cattle on a thousand hills? Don't you know I created everything? And don't you know that I know the very number of hairs on your head? Don't you know? So why are you afraid? Why are you fearful? Why are you running from your worst fears? Verse 15, the Lord said to him, the Lord didn't say, oh, Elijah, I know, Elijah, you've been so faithful to me. I know, Elijah, you are so zealous for me. I know, Elijah, that you are just the man of God that I created you to be. The Lord didn't say that. You know what the Lord said? The Lord gave him instruction. Get up, get to work. Let's read this. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, go, Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazel, king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephat of Abel Meloah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall come about, the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel, Jehu, shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall put to death. But yet, he says, Elijah... I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. He tells Elijah, get up, go. You've got two kings to anoint, and you've got a, a, a prophet to raise up. Go. And by the way, Elijah, i got 7,000 more men in Israel who worship me just the way you do. 7,000, remember, is a number uh, seven. The number seven is the number of completion. The Lord said, I have a complete number of people who are still my prophets. So when we get caught up in all this me, 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 I, 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 God's got it all figured out. God's got a whole other army. You know, it goes on later on in the scripture, and I'm, I'm going to stop here, but it goes later on in scripture. It says that Elijah raised up the new prophet, Elisha. And later on, Elisha understood the power of the Lord. He knew that the kings and queens were after him to kill him, Elisha, Elijah's pupil. And Elisha was with his servant, and Elisha was in a house, and the enemy had surrounded the whole camp where he was. And the servant of Elisha came out and said, Oh, my master! Oh, Lord! He was looking at the, the, the army surrounding the whole camp where Elisha was. And the servant of Elisha said, We're in big trouble now. We're going to die. And Elisha went out there and said, Oh, Lord, open this boy's eyes so he could see that the ones who are for us are greater than the ones who are against us. And when that boy's eyes were open, he saw the armies of the living God behind the enemy. And they were encircling the enemy. And that's how we need to understand all the mess that you're going through. God will make a way for you and God will give you escape. He'll give you refuge. Now we need to understand that we have a devil. There's a devil in this world. Revelation chapter 12 verse 12. You pull up that other scripture, I'll read that. Revelation 12, 12, it says, For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. Now, some people say that this verse, Revelation 12, 12, will happen at a future date. Some people believe that it happened at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe it happened already. I believe the devil has already been cast out of heaven. Because Christ returned back to heaven as Lord and Savior of the world. And there is no room for Satan anymore in heaven. 
he lost his place. The book of Job records that Satan was able to enter in and out of the throne of God in the Old Testament times. But I do believe that Satan in the New Testament times, in our times, in the times of the church, has been cast down to the earth. And I believe that's why persecution is so intense today. Because Satan himself, he's not God. Satan is not omnipresence like God. You know, he can't be everywhere at one time. Amen? He's not like God. But he is a being. And he is somewhere on the face of this earth. Now, Brother Danny, we talked about that spiritual warfare. If your spiritual eyes were to be open right now, in this world, you would be freaking out left and right, seeing demonic spirits all in this place. Not here in the church. They ain't in here. I promise you that right now. They, 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 they can't stand at the hearing of the Word of God. They flee. But, when, but right now, there are angels in this room. I tell you on the authority of the Word of God. There are angels in this room. There's some angels sitting right next to you. Amen. Right next to you. There are some angels. They're not to be worshipped, but there are our fellow brothers, our fellow servants oh, to the Lord God Almighty. And these angels, these beings have been around for a very long time. Amen. And they know how to help you. And they know how to encourage you. The Bible says they're ministering spirits. But my point is, there are some demonic spirits that have been around for a very long time. And they know how to attack you. And they know your weak points, just like they knew Elijah's. They knew Elijah's weakness. And they know your weakness. And they will attack. They're relentless. They're cowards. Just when you think you have victory in your life, expect the attack. That's why the Bible tells a Christian, be prepared in season and out of season. In season and out of season. Revelation 12, 17 says this. So the dragon, who is the dragon? Come on, church. Talk to me, church. Satan was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. There, Satan has declared war on a certain group of people in this world. It's the Christians. Those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Do you hold to the testimony of Jesus today? Do you? No, no, I'm not just saying, oh, I got a cross tattooed on my back. I wear a gold chain with a cross. That's not holding to the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about is the Word of God imprinted on your heart? Is righteousness and holiness and godliness something that you're seeking after? Because those are the people who are holding to the testimony of Jesus. They believe that Jesus died for their sin, but that Jesus rose from the dead. And they believe that the Holy Spirit who came can cleanse them and encourage them and strengthen them and put the, just the power of God in their life. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. People who believe in that, who experience that, who are a new creation in Almighty God, those are the people who are holding to the testimony of Jesus. And those are the people who Satan has declared war on. Those are the people that Satan says, I declare war on you. Why would he have to declare war on unbelievers in this world when he already has them, when he already owns them? The Bible clearly teaches that. But it goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 10.13, I want to give you some encouragement, Christian. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be attempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way to escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. God will not allow you to go through anything that can make you fall. Anything. Nothing. What you're going through right now, and I speak to you, listen by way of the internet. What you're going through right now is a testing from God and is a temptation from Satan. Now if you give heed, if you go into the ways of Satan, you will fall into temptation and sin and die. But if you trust in the ways of the Lord, you will endure in this time of testing that you're going through and you will be victorious in Jesus Christ. You're going to be tempted or tested, one or the other. You're going to fail or you're going to pass, one or the other. But we will not be put anything upon us that God will not deliver us from. Psalm 27, 14 says this, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. We got to slow down. As a matter of fact, we gotta, some of us got to come to a complete stop. We just got to stop. You know, if you're on a train, put the, put the brakes on. I've always liked being in those little, in San Antonio, they got those little trolleys. I like to hit that little horn just to aggravate people, you know, because they'll make them want to stop. 
You know, that, that's what it reminds me of. You can honk the horn, stop, get attention. We just got to stop. And we just got to wait upon Jesus. Some of us are running so far ahead of God, and God is like, well, what are you doing? Just like you told Elijah, what are you doing? Get back over here. Some of you know what I'm talking about with little kids when you go into the supermarket, amen? When you run and go into the mall, those little kids just run back and forth, amen? They just run. You're like, you're trying to get them, and they done took off, and you don't have the legs they have anymore. But God does. And God loves you. And God is saying, what are you doing? Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Our heart has to be touched. Really, our minds have to be changed so that our heart can be touched. Wait for the Lord. God has given you instruction in your mind so that way your heart can take heed and bring it forth to action. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 says this. It says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in what you're going through. That don't make sense, does it? Well, guess what? The world will have you believe that it don't make sense to praise Jesus. Someone you cannot see, someone you cannot hear. It don't make sense to be a Christian in this world, does it? It doesn't. It don't make no sense in this world. People in this world believe in what they see. They believe in what they hear. And, and, and they see it and they can touch it. Oh, we can go on and on about that. But the Lord is saying, rejoice when you go through these trials, when you go through these tribulations, when you go all kinds of various things. And many of us are going through various things. Rejoice, He says, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold. Your faith is more precious, precious than all the gold in this world. Do you know that? Yes. You alone. You alone. Your faith, your very life is more precious than anything else to God. You alone. You alone. And God is wanting to transform you. And that's the only way God is going to transform you. To go through the fire. To put your faith to the test. To stop running from your fears. A lot of times we want to stop this process of drawing closer to God because the fear of, of, of being persecuted. You know, so, so therefore they say, okay, okay, I'm, I'm just going to chill out. I'm not going to go after the Lord. And I've seen that happen time and time again. But the more you draw near to God, it's just the opposite. The devil will flee from you. And the Bible teaches that. It says, resist the devil. Resist the devil. Draw near to God and the devil will flee. The more you get closer to the Lord, the devil will soon run because he cannot be in the presence of the Lord. He is terrified because God is God. So, it's, it's kind of a, a level, like a video game. When you first start your Christian walk, you're not that close to, the, to, 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 to where you want to be. You're just starting. The, devil's, the enemy's got a lot of play with you. But the more you start getting towards the end, you got to start getting to perfection. The devil, the enemy will not have any more influence over your life because you're becoming stronger and stronger and you're becoming mature and no longer will you allow the fears to come into you like you did when you first started off, when you were an infant in Christ. When you mature in Christ, you should be able to have no fear come into you because you are now a spirit-flowing Christian. But it's so easy to get knocked back, just like Elijah. It's so easy. It's so easy. But I will rejoice in this. I will rejoice in what the Lord has done. Receive this, name, this message in Jesus' name.